that. Our theme scripture for us as we, uh, this is the second week of a series here is Matthew 5, verses 13 to 15. It's kind of a longer one, so let's read it all together. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. So uh, there's an election coming up. And last Sunday, when I said that, a couple of you got up and headed for the exits. Um, so it's just... Take a deep breath, trust me a little bit in this if you can, but, but one of the things we determined to do when we started 211, 20 plus year, 20 years and one week ago now, is uh, to answer questions people are asking, to talk about stuff that the culture's talking about, and we also determined that we weren't gonna avoid hard topics, and I think those two things kinda come together around an election and politics and stuff. But I wanna, I wanna reassure you in advance, and this is gonna disappoint some of you and maybe make others of you happy, um, but I'm not going to tell you who to vote for. So that might make you happy, might make you sad. Uh, I'm not going to tell you which political party to be a part of. You've got to figure that out on your own. Um, and I think, but I think we should figure it out. Um, so anyway, if that makes you upset, I'm sorry. And if it makes you happy, that's good. So there you go. Uh, but anyway, last Sunday we identified seven questions that um, I think people are asking around uh, the political kind of spectrum. Uh, first one is, should Christians identify as Republican or Democrat or Independent or whatever, Green Party, whatever? Um, can a Christian be a Republican or Democrat or whatever? And we talked about, and I don't want to get into it all, but the party of the Lamb, the Lamb of God, Jesus the Lamb of God, is greater than uh, the party of the donkey or the elephant, and I should, hold on a minute. I'm not gonna totally um, disrobe here or anything, but I did wanna show you what one of our astute congregate members gave me this past week. How about that, huh? Yes. You too can give the pastor a t-shirt. Okay, so um, anyway, um, what does God have to say about government was our next question. And we talked about that last Sunday. Should uh, the church be involved in politics? And uh, we talked about that last Sunday as well. And how do I deal with an evil or bad, whatever? How do I deal with it when an evil leader is elected? Uh, that's, so those were four questions we dealt with last Sunday. I would encourage you, if you weren't here last Sunday, to go to ChristLincoln.org and click on the right buttons there, go back to the live stream, and you'll be able to see last Sunday's message or uh, go to BoxCast. You can watch it on your television. Uh, just search for Christ Lincoln on BoxCast. But um, I think that message last week was really important as we answered those questions. So if you're curious and you weren't here, what I said, uh, that's a place to go. The questions for today are, Jesus did not try to change Rome so what does that mean for us as Christians in our political realm? Does the personal life of a leader matter? I think a lot of people are asking that question. And does the Bible say anything about various issues that we face as a culture, as a nation? Does the Bible say anything about uh, any of those issues? So again, if you missed last week's message, questions one to four, I encourage you to go and check that out. And, and also remember as you settle in that I'm not gonna tell you who to vote for today um, and I'm not gonna tell you what party to be a part of. Um, so you can hold me to that. But I am going to encourage you to be an informed citizen because God's given us the gift of this nation. And people have given their lives so that we would have the opportunity to participate in the political process, that we would have the opportunity to vote. And of course, if we're gonna vote, we need to be informed first. What good is it to vote if you're not informed? So this is a season where we need to be informed and, um, and then vote and be involved in the political process as God leads us. All right, so let's dive in. Let's start with question number five on that list. Jesus did not try to change Rome. What does that mean for us? So I wanna, the first part of that, that question is a statement that I wanna set up for us. 
that might or might not be a question that you've asked, but many Christians in our country and throughout history have asked this question. Um, so here's the deal. We are followers of Jesus. I'm going to presume this morning, I'm hoping that you all gathered here know that you're a sinner and know that Jesus died for you to give you forgiveness. I'm hoping that you all trust Jesus' death and resurrection for you, that you have the gift of eternal life because of what Jesus has done for you. So I'm hoping that you're in that camp. And if you're not, I invite you to be in that camp. Um, but as a follower of Jesus, then I want to do what Jesus did right? It makes sense for following somebody. So I want to become more like him every day. So when we talk politics, guess what? Jesus never said anything about the Roman emperor or about Rome, really. He never said one word advocating that uh, there should be a democracy or that it should, the government should be a republic or against a dictatorship or whatever. He never said anything about that. He never spoke about Roman law, really. Um, he never condemned uh, the terrible ethical practices of the Roman leadership, uh, the Roman emperor, nothing. He was totally quiet in that regard. So the argument goes, if Jesus had that stance regarding the government of his day, how does that impact us as followers of Jesus in our day? Should we have that kind of stance of not being involved in politics? We're going to, that's, that's dirty business. We're not going to be involved in that. Jesus wasn't involved in it, all that. The Amish, for instance, they, they find themselves in, like they're one of the groups that find themselves living in this world, and yet they're not, unless, unless the political question directly affects them, they're not involved. Not, that's somebody else's business. Other Christians have a different view of that, uh, of this question. And I would put myself in this other camp here, okay? They, other Christians note that when Jesus lived at the time of the Roman Empire, nobody basically outside of the Roman Senate, perhaps, had any influence on government in that day. Uh, there was no opportunity for that. We, on the other hand, live in a republic. Not a democracy, by the way. We live in a republic, right? Um, so we have opportunities that were not afforded to Jesus, at least in his human nature. Um, we have the opportunity to vote. We, Jesus didn't have that. We have the opportunity to run for office. Jesus, humanly speaking, did not have that opportunity. Uh, we have the opportunity to contact our representatives, to make our voices heard in the culture, uh, so uh, Jesus didn't have those opportunities, humanly speaking, as he lived out his life. So the argument goes, and I would agree with this, that if Jesus lived in the 21st century America, um, he would have tried to influence public policy. He t Jesus talks about being salt and light in the culture. And so he would have been salt and light in the culture. I would say amen to that. I think that's what Jesus would have done today and what we as Jesus followers would do in our setting today, which is much different than his setting years ago. With this caveat, that our calling to influence public policy never become more important than our calling to reach people with the good news of Jesus and the gift of eternal life. That is a higher calling and we have to keep those callings in balance and really have a higher priority to reach lost people for, with the gospel of salvation, okay? Next question. Does the personal life of a leader matter? And there's been a lot, a lot, a lot of talk about this over, not just now, but over the years. Does the personal life of a leader matter? So I wanna look at this from a couple of different angles just to get you thinking, give you something to talk about over lunch today. First, I've always been impressed by this quote from a guy named John Jay. Uh, John Jay, you may not know, I'll, I'll bet only 5% of us know who that is. Uh, John Jay was the first Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court. So a pretty important guy in our founding, John Jay. This is what he said. Providence, in other words, God, has given to our people the choice of their ruler, and it is the duty as well as the privilege and interest of our Christian nation to select and prefer Christians for their rulers. Oop. 
I don't know if that shocks you, surprises you. If you already heard that quote, I don't know. Um, whether you agree or disagree with it, don't know. But that's what the first Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court said about the character of our nation and about the leaders that we should prefer in our nation. And by Christians, he meant not only people who uh, you know, claim Jesus every four years to get elected, but people who live out their calling as followers of Jesus. Uh, when people have great power but don't have humility, don't have a heart of a servant, dangerous things can happen. That's one side of looking at that. Another side of looking at that is, if you need open heart surgery, would you prefer a great surgeon who's a horrible person or a Christian who's a mediocre surgeon? I'd prefer a Christian who's a great surgeon. Sometimes they're not available. In that case, I prefer a great surgeon who might have a terrible personal life than a mediocre surgeon who's a Christian. I'll let her do the surgery and I'll do the praying and we'll leave it at that. Does the personal life of a leader matter? Kind of gives the opposite side on that. But since we're in church, I think it's more important, John Jay, more important than John Jay or Pastor Shike is the Bible. So what does God say about does the personal life of a leader matter? We're going to give two examples. Last Sunday we mentioned King David. A thousand years before Jesus, the ideal king against which every other king in Scripture is measured. He's called a man after God's own heart in the Bible. That's, that's pretty high praise to be called a man after God's own heart. On the other hand, he was married to multiple women at the same time. I might add. And what's more, there's the famous story of King David looking at this woman taking a bath, aptly named Bathsheba. I don't know if that's a coincidence or not. I found a picture, but I didn't want to put it up on the screen for embarrassment. But anyway, um, you can guess what happens there. Even though David's married to multiple wives, he figures that he needs Bathsheba as well. And one thing leads to another, and he wants her so much that he winds up having her husband murdered. That's not the sort of guy I would vote for. I'll just say, I, if I had the chance, I'd vote for somebody else, I think. So guess what? God deposes David from his kingship. Oh, wait a minute, you Bible scholars don't remember that? That's because it didn't happen. God did not take him off the throne after that. Does the personal life of a leader matter? Does, it doesn't. God did not depose David. I think I might have, but God didn't. Maybe God knows something I don't know. That gives me pause for thought. Giving you things to think about here is what I'm doing. On the other hand, there's this King Ahab in the Bible. And the Bible, this is what the Bible says about him. Ahab did more evil in the eyes of the Lord than any of those before him. There was never anyone like King Ahab who sold himself to do evil in the eyes of the Lord, urged on by Jezebel, his wife. That's pretty bad. And at some point, apparently God had enough of King Ahab. And in 1 Kings 22, we read this. Ahab is in a battle, and someone drew his bow at random and hit King Ahab of Israel between the sections of his armor. The king told his chariot driver, wheel around and get me out of the fighting. I've been wounded. All day long the battle raged, and the king was propped up in his chariot facing the Arameans. The blood from his womb ran down to the floor of the chariot, and that evening he died. And it gets more graphic from there, which I won't get into. We got the point. The point is God had enough at some point, and God removed Ahab from kingship, from his throne. Does the personal life of a leader matter? In David's case, he was a sinner, like all of us, and he had very significant private sins. But in his public office, he always consistently led people in faithfulness and worship of God, pretty consistently. In spite of his personal sins, which were grievous, which were terrible, there is this sense of David that he had this humility, 
that he had this knowledge that he was responsible to God for what he was doing in his leadership. And in Ahab's case, you could say he's a worse sinner. The Bible says he's a worse sinner. But the key to me seems that he led the people into wickedness by what he was doing. Uh, I think that's significant, that King Ahab led God's people into wickedness. That's, that was the way he led. And so his private life was a mess, but his public policies, if you will, were also bad. Uh, not just bad, but evil. And that may be a key there. So does the personal life of a leader matter? I think that's something to talk about and wrestle with as we get into this political season. But policies kind of leads us to our final question. And it's amazing how it kind of flows that way. Um, Does the Bible say anything about the various issues that we face as a nation? Does the Bible say anything about public policy? And on the one hand, we have to be clear about this, that the Bible does not specifically say which laws we should enact. So we need to be clear about that. It's not like you you can't just take the laws that God gave Israel in the Old Testament nation and then enact them today in our nation. The Bible never says that we should do that. Um, So we don't don't just take, the the Bible doesn't say "This, this law is the way you should go, this law is not. On the other hand, God is our creator And there is such a thing as God's moral law. And when you violate that law, bad things happen. Uh, It's kind of like the law of gravity. If you say, well, we're just going to check out and violate the law of gravity and see what happens, you're not going to last very long. And the same thing is true when we, as individuals or as a nation, uh, violate the moral law that God's laid down for us in Scripture. When we violate those laws, we don't last very long. Things don't go well with us. Government, for instance, is instituted to protect the innocent and and punish the wrongdoer. We went over that last Sunday. And and so God's, uh, in Scripture, God basically says that government is there to influence the way we live in public with one another. Uh, Violating God's law in private, we'll experience the consequences of that. But as public policy... It's important that the government know the moral law so that they can enact laws which will uh, lead the society to live in those ways. So the Bible clearly does have some things to say about some of the moral issues that we face today as a culture. Um, I I can't list all the issues here today, that's not the point, but there are some where the Bible is very clear about some of the moral issues we face. And so I wanna go through and touch on six of them. You might wish I had hit seven or eight or nine. Um, We'll see how that all goes. But let's let's kinda get into it at least for a little bit. Uh, First is life, because God gave us the gift of life, human life. God's the giver of life. From the moment of conception to the moment of natural death, God is the giver of life. The Christian faith spread in the Roman Empire in large part because of the Christian ethic, the biblical ethic of life, the understanding that the Christians had in the Roman Empire that children are a gift of God. Whether in the womb, out of the womb, children are a gift of God. Romans did not, the Roman Empire, people did not view it that way. But people were attracted to the Christian ethic of life, life as a gift of God. And so, Because it's clear in Scripture that life is a gift of God, it's incumbent upon our government, we said government's instituted to protect the innocent, punish the wrongdoer, that government protect the innocent, protect children, in the womb and out of the womb. And and political parties, candidates, they may fail on that terribly, they may fail less egregiously, but what an opportunity for us as followers of Jesus who understand where life comes from. What an opportunity for us to be salt and light in our culture, in a positive way to be able to influence culture, to influence politics. The second one we'll talk about is care for the poor. We could could list, like spend 20 minutes of the sermon just reading Bible verses about God's commands to us to care for the widow, to care for the orphan, to care for the poor, and so on and so on. It goes on and on. So our public policy should reflect care for the poor. God's command that we 
both as individuals and as the church, care for the poor. Not one of those Bible verses, by the way, allows us off the hook to say, oh, well, the government's doing that, so we don't have to do that. that there's no verse in the Bible like that. In the Bible, the, care, the command to care for the poor is not given to the government. The command to care for the poor is given to you and me and us as a church. That's where the mission of the month comes from, is to be able to care for those in need around us, right? Um, if you look throughout the New Testament, it's not the government who takes money from one set of people and gives it to another set of people. It's the church through voluntary offerings gathered together that's woven throughout the New Testament, voluntary offerings to care for those in need. That's care for the poor. And public policy should, and our leaders should put in place policies that will help us as Christians, as individuals, as a church to care for the poor. Economics. Politicians often say it's the economy. I'm not going to say the next word because kids are here. So anyway, but it's the economy. And there's some truth to that saying. The reality is there is such a thing in the seventh commandment. Thou shalt not steal. That's an economic commandment. Thou shalt not steal. Huge implications for economic policy. Uh, domestically here in the United States and also around the world. So be informed about that. Dig into that. What is that seventh commandment mean? How does that influence, how should it influence public policy? I'll leave that up to you to kind of sort through. Race relations. I, I don't know. I feel like this is the obvious, but I'm extremely saddened to say it's not obvious that we're all descended from Adam and Eve that racism has no place in our culture, and certainly not in the church, but in our culture as well. And of all people, we Christians should be able to make the case not to divide people according to race. We're all one together, descended from Adam and Eve. And we need to uh, reject then public policies that divide us based on race and applaud public policies that bring us together, that unite us as one. Uh, so I'm going to go through these kind of quickly here. Sexual ethic. Uh, we said that in the early church, one of the reasons that the Christian faith spread was uh, the, the citizens of Rome were attracted to the Christian ethic of life. Uh, second to that, perhaps, or maybe above that, I don't know, uh, the Roman uh, citizens were attracted to the Christian ethic of sexuality. This uh, knowledge given to us in Scripture that God created us male and female that God gave us the gift of marriage between one man and one woman for life. The way that uh, Christian men and women treated one another attracted unbelievers to the faith. Because in Roman culture, well, Romans just used and abused their women and cast them aside. That women were second-class citizens. But Christian men were taught from Scripture to treat women as equals, as co-heirs, with the gift of eternal life. And so one way we can be salt and light in our culture is Christian men, are you treating your wife as an equal? Are you treating her as a co-heir of eternal life with you? Christian women, same thing. How are you treating your husband? As a co-heir of eternal life, as an equal with you. That sexual ethic will uh, draw people to the Christian faith as we are salt and light in the culture. Care for the planet. I'll end with this one. <clears throat> uh, in part because we're out of time and in part because this is the first commandment. Genesis 1, verse, Genesis 1, verse 28. God blessed Adam and Eve and said, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea, the birds in the sky, and over every living creature that moves on the ground. All right, so I was wrong. The first commandment is be fruitful and multiply. Some of you are doing that very well. Thank you for doing that. That's great. Congratulations. Um, but the second commandment then in this verse here is to rule over the earth. And the word rule doesn't mean use and abuse the earth. It means to care for the planet God gave us. And so we Christians, that, that's, that's God just commands that for us. We're, we're to care for and steward the planet that we live on. God's God's calling to us as Christians. So we should be first in supporting the planet God gave us. Now I'm not talking about you know, man-made global warming and all that stuff. That's all scientific stuff. You need to sort that out and study that for yourself and everything. But um, the overarching idea of caring for the planet is, 
It's God's thing. It's a moral thing in Scripture. And so that should inform public policy. We should um, dig into the science, understand what is the best ways in which we can care for the planet, and uh, go with that. All right, so uh, um, I kind of want to, cl- well, let me, let me say this. I'm going to get into this more um, in podcasts in the coming couple of weeks. So if you don't listen to the podcast, just search for Eagles on the Hill, and we'll dig into some of this stuff even more in the podcast. Um, but I want to close with um, the theme scripture we had at the beginning because it really impacts what we're saying today. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it up on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. Jesus calls us as his redeemed people to be a light on the hill, a light for our culture, a light involved in the political process, to be informed citizens of our nation. We get to be of the party of the Lamb, first and foremost, the party of the Lamb of God, and because of that, be able to be salt and light influencing our culture for good. That's God's call to us in the political process. Let's stand.